Well, hello, and welcome to Fuquay Verena United Methodist Church. My name is Owen. I'm one of the pastors here, if we haven't had a chance to meet yet, and we're glad you're here. We know that life can get crazy, and sometimes we have to find time to worship during the week, and so we have crafted this worship opportunity just for you. Uh, we know, you know, nothing's perfect, but whenever you're worshiping and wherever you're worshiping, we're glad that we can be here worshiping together. Uh, if you are with us for the first time or you'd like to let us know you're here, uh, if they just got questions we can follow up with. We'd love for you to text us, send uh, the word hello to the number that's right here at the bottom of your screen. We'd love to get back in touch with you as soon as we can to see how we can connect or help solve whatever it is uh, that you've got for us. So don't hesitate to reach out. Also, if this is an opportunity that you regularly participate in and you'd like to partner with us in Michigan, and ministry. Uh, we'd love to have that partnership with you as we serve our greater community here around Fuquay Verena. Um, you can go to our website, fvumc.org slash give. Uh, and we'd love, again, any sort of support that you can offer will help us continue to do this and do it well. Um, and so you can check that out while you're there. Um, anything that you need, hopefully, will be right there on our website. Uh, particularly if you're looking for other worship opportunities, uh, you'll be able to see those on our worship page. Uh, and again, we're just so glad you're here and we hope that you find something meaningful, something you can hang your hat on this week as we participate in worship together. of the saints that have gone before us, that are now kneeling at the foot of the throne, worshiping our Almighty Father. Sing. Jesus is in this room. Hello, friends. Uh, last week, we talked about the liminal space between Ascension and Pentecost. If you were with us, you may remember that we talked about how um, after the resurrection, Jesus spent about 40 days with his disciples before he then ascended into heaven. Today, we're going to spend a little bit more time talking about Ascension and kind of this liminal space of time in between and next week, we're going to talk about a little bit more about Pentecost, what happens that 10 days later when the Holy Spirit uh, comes, and we often celebrate the, that day as the birthday of the church. So we have that to look forward to next week, but today we're going to spend just a little bit more time kind of dwelling in the midst of this in-between space uh, as we celebrate Ascension Sunday. Our scripture today begins by talking about Jesus and those kind of 40 days that he has spent with his disciples post-resurrection. We're going to be reading from Acts chapter 1, verse 1. So if you want to follow along with us, you are more than welcome to. It says, uh, in the first book, Theophilus, I wrote about all that Jesus began to do and teach until the day when he was taken up into heaven, ascension, uh, after giving instructions through the Holy Spirit to the apostles whom he had chosen. 
After his suffering, he presented himself alive um, to them by many convincing proofs, appearing to them during those 40 days, 40 days we've been talking about, and speaking about the kingdom of God. While staying with them, he ordered them not to leave Jerusalem, but to wait there for the promise of the Father. This, Jesus said, is what you have heard from me, for John baptized with water, but you, you will be baptized with the Holy Spirit not many days from now. Um, here we hear uh, Jesus's promise of the Holy Spirit given to them, but I don't necessarily know that they fully understand exactly uh, what is to come, even though Jesus here is saying that the Holy Spirit not many days from now is, is going to be coming. So we're going to pick up in, in verse six. They still kind of have some questions to ask. Uh, they start by asking, Lord, is this the time when you will restore the kingdom to Israel? Jesus replied, it is not for you to know the times or periods of the Father has set by his own authority, but you, you will receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you and you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem and all of Judea and Samaria and to the ends of the earth. When he had said this, um, as they were watching, Jesus was lifted up and a cloud took him out of their sight. While he was going and they were gazing up towards heaven, suddenly two men with white robes stood by them. They said, men of Galilee, why do you stand looking up towards heaven? This Jesus who has been taken up from you into heaven will come in the same way as you saw him go into heaven. We'll flip back to, uh, to verse eight. It says, but you will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes upon you and you will be my witnesses. These are the last words uh, that Jesus said to his disciples and then suddenly he is gone. In that moment, he's ascended to the Father to go to dwell with God. He's no longer present in bodily form with his disciples in the same way that he was. I have to wonder kind of what, what that moment must have felt like for them as they were having a conversation with Jesus and then in that moment, everything changed. I wonder, were they feeling like, gosh, they had just been abandoned? I wonder if they felt grief all over again, the same kind of grief that they must have felt uh, between Jesus' death and resurrection, wondering what had gone wrong and what had happened. I wonder if the promise that Jesus had given them, even right there in that very moment, uh, that the Holy Spirit was coming not long from now, that they should go and wait. I wonder how that promise felt to them. If it felt like a promise that they could hold on to and cling to in that moment, or if it just felt so far off and not understandable that they didn't even know what to do with that information at that point. Friends, I have to believe that the ascension of Jesus was marked by grief for the disciples, that their best friend, their rabbi, their teacher, their travel partner, um, all of a sudden he was gone. To be fair, Jesus had made it very clear that he was going to be leaving. And uh, even that being said, it was probably hard for the disciples to deal with the fact that just in an instant, he was gone. I feel like this is maybe feels like something very uh, unfamiliar to us. And yet I think there are things um, that I know ahead of time. And yet at the same time, I'm still surprised when it is happening, right? Um, the way that I see this show up in my family the most is maybe your family doesn't have this problem, but my family is notorious for just being terrible at saying goodbye. Um, I should admit that I 100% do this as well. Um, and something that someone told me recently is that in the South, it takes like a whole hour to say goodbye. Like you have to allot an hour from the beginning of when you say, my time here is done, I'm gonna let you go, to when you finally are, are driving <clears throat> out of the driveway. Um, and yes, like that is a hundred percent my family. Uh, maybe if your family has somehow escaped this reality, you don't know what this feels like or looks like. So here's, here's how it goes. Um, first in my family, you have to say goodbye in the living room or maybe at the dinner table, if that's where you're last hanging out. And at that point, if you have finally established that like, yes, you actually are leaving, then you have to walk together to the front door or the side door or wherever. And then when you get there, you have to say round two of goodbyes. You have to, you know, say goodbye again. And then the longest part, truly, at least in our household, is then you have to walk from the door to the car to also say goodbye at the car again. 
And if your family is anything like mine, like this is where all the questions begin. Like it's like reality sets in of like, oh, this person is about to leave. And I had like these 15,000 questions that I haven't asked them yet. And so I'm going to stand here at their car while their car is on, just having this full on conversation and asking the 15 questions that I could have asked during the last three hours that we were together, but it just like didn't occur to me that this person was going to be leaving until this very moment. And so now I'm going to ask them, even though I could have asked them a very long time ago. Does this sound familiar? Maybe, maybe it's just our family. Um, this honestly <laughs> is the stage <laughs> that takes forever. And then slowly, if, if the miracle allows, you just like start slowly backing down the driveway and saying like, bye, see you later. <laughs> and then finally you have made it through the, the hour long process of actually saying goodbye. It's, it's a whole thing y'all. And it is, it's never a surprise that gatherings are going to end, right? We, we know this. Um, and yet, somehow even knowing that reality doesn't change the fact that we're still surprised uh, when when it happens and when it's time. I really think in some ways that this is what's happening in scripture today. Jesus has thoroughly prepared his disciples that he is not going to stay with them forever. He has said this before his death and resurrection. He said this again after the resurrection. And he's saying it again in the scripture right here, um, literally moments before his ascension. He told his disciples, like, this is what's going to happen. You need to stay in Jerusalem and wait. The Holy Spirit is coming. And however, the Jesus, when Jesus finally does ascend in our passage today, um, do you remember like what the disciples do? What they say? The scripture says that they just stand there staring into heaven like they don't know where Jesus went. Friends, just because we're prepared for something doesn't mean uh, that we are ever actually ready for it to happen in that moment. Just because we know it's going to happen doesn't mean that we know in this moment that we're ready. I bet the disciples knew that Jesus was leaving, and yet they still were caught off guard uh, when it actually happened, just finding themselves looking into heaven, uh, wondering what was happening. When Jesus goes to be with God, though, he doesn't leave the disciples alone. He tells them that the Advocate, the Holy Spirit, is coming to be with them. They're to wait in Jerusalem for the coming of the Holy Spirit. And then their next assignment is that they are to go after the Holy Spirit has come to go and be witnesses to all of Jerusalem and then to all of the world. This proclamation that they are to go to be witnesses, it would not have been a brand new thing to them. They would have gone and told many people about Jesus, about the works that he is doing and the ways in which he was healing many people, this wouldn't have been new to them. And yet, I'm aware that there are maybe two things that would have been different uh, for them, maybe this time around. Uh, first is that this time, instead of going to be witnesses to everyone about uh, Jesus and the present miracles that he is in the midst of doing, that they could invite people to come and to be with Jesus right there, um, they also would have been testifying about Jesus's death and resurrection and they would have been doing this while grief still would have been fresh and at the top of their mind. So they weren't just saying something that would have been kind of a rational assent or something uh, that is intellectual knowledge to be shared to another person, but they're sharing deep personal stories, uh, stories, yes, even filled with grief in that moment. Second thing that I'm mindful of is that they, you know, they didn't have a home base in the same way to come back to. Um, they didn't have Jesus to, to come back to process, like, how did that go? What went well? What didn't? And maybe what, what can we do next time that's to be different? Uh, and then to be sent back out and then to come back and then to be sent back out. However, we know that Jesus did not just send them out on their own. They had this foretold promise that the Holy Spirit uh, would be with them, not just one particular place, but the Holy Spirit would be with each and every one of them wherever they went. And I think that uh, this promise of presence shows up in a really beautiful way, particularly in a season uh, that would have been filled with grief. And to know that their God was not just present in one place, uh, not just present in the temple, not just present in uh, the person and body of Jesus, but that God now was everywhere, that the Holy Spirit would fill them, be within them, and also uh, within all of those around them. As I've been preparing for the sermon, I've been thinking a lot about the power of presence. 
I also have been watching Cheer on Netflix, uh, which has made me reminisce a lot on my, um, my days actually as a gymnast growing up. And one of the skills that I vividly remember learning how to do was a standing back tuck, which basically, if you're not familiar, is just like a back flip. But instead of doing it in a series of flips, you were just doing it from a standing position. I remember being terrified <laughs> of this skill at the time. Um, mostly, I was afraid that if I jumped and didn't rotate enough that I would just land on my head. <laughs> I started learning by standing on the floor and uh, flipping into a nice, soft, and cushy foam pit. So really soft, easy landing, couldn't really mess it up. And once I felt pretty comfortable doing that, then I kind of leveled up and I had several mats that I kind of stacked on top of each other on the floor. And instead of flipping into the foam pit, I flipped onto the floor, but from the mats that were kind of stacked on top of one another. And it gave me several more feet to be able to correct myself if I needed to so that I could actually land on my feet, even if I didn't rotate enough. And in that stage of learning, I remember that there was one time that I had asked my coach to come over and spot me. I think this was the very beginning of when I had switched from like the foam pit to the mats. And my coach came over and was spotting me and kind of making sure that I didn't fall on my face, that I landed in the correct place and all of that. And if you are familiar with, with a back tuck, then typically when you are flipping, you want to make sure that your hands are like in the right place, that they are like above your ears kind of thing. Um, and they just kind of go, you know, straight back with you. However, <laughs> When she was spotting me, I remembered that something went wrong or whatever. And instead of putting my arm like straight behind my head, I like moved it over to the side <laughs> as I was flipping. And that was the side that she was on. And so I ended up just like straight up smacking her in the face. Miraculously, she still made sure that I landed on my feet, which was very kind, and very generous. And I, yeah, I felt terrible about the whole thing. She was very generous and very kind and somehow even agreed to keep spotting me after that. But I, gosh, just felt so bad. And I remember after that um, being like in awe of the fact that she still was willing to spot me nonetheless, even though I had, you know, smacked her in the face. Um, anyway, so after I had finally kind of mastered that uh, being on stacked on the mats, I felt like, you know, finally I was ready to just test this thing out, do it on the floor. And I, again, asked for a spot several more times to make sure that I, I could do it, could test it out on my own. And I wasn't going to land on my face or smack her in the face either. And after a lot of practice of this, there came a time where it was, you know, very clear that I could do it. I had the skill down pat. There was um, no reason to need a spot anymore. But the only reason that I couldn't do it is my own confidence. Like I didn't feel like I had mastered it enough or have enough confidence in myself to feel like I've got this, you know, on my own. And so when I asked my coach to spot me, you know, she was acutely aware to these things. And instead of actually like putting her hands out, spotting me, helping make sure uh, that my feet, you know, landed on the ground and all that kind of thing, she just stood there. And she said, you know, I'll, I'll catch you if you fall and I'll make sure to spot you if you need it. Uh, but I'm just, I'm just going to stand here. And I remember thinking, like, what are you doing? <laughs> like, this is not going to be helpful at all. Like, I need you to make sure you, you're going to be reaching out, making sure I land on my feet. Um, but I also remember that in that moment, um, her, her presence was powerful I had stood there while she was across the gym and tried to work myself up in my brain to, to do this and have the kind of confidence to own it myself, and, and I couldn't do it. But the moment that she walked over, she just stood there, didn't even put her hands out or anything like that. Um, but because she was there, I knew that I had the confidence uh, and the courage to be able to, to jump. And I knew that if I really needed her, she'd be there to catch me. But her very presence held power in that moment. This concept that presence has power is not new to us, right? The power of presence is real. It's powerful. It can be life-changing uh, to know that somebody is there with you in the midst of the good things, the bad things, the hard things. Um, sometimes things that feel so insurmountable, uh, like for me, this, this back tuck, 
um, if I were to, to do that on my own, it would have, yeah, been just that insurmountable. But because the presence of my coach was there, all of a sudden, this became possible, doable, something that I knew I could do simply because of her presence there right next to me. Friends, I believe that when people show up for us, it reminds us that we're not alone, that we are seen, that we are loved, we are not forgotten, and that that person believes in us. I couldn't have had, um, or I could have had all of the training in the world to do this back tuck. I could have been more than ready. And yet, there's nothing better than the power and the gift of presence, a boat that reminds us that we're not alone, and also the power and the gift that reminds us and empowers us to be able to do the work that we are equipped and empowered to do. We just might be too afraid uh, to do on our own. I think that's part of why the promise and the presence of the Holy Spirit in this kind of liminal space that we've been talking about over the last week uh, has been really helpful and powerful and important to me. There are a lot of promises that Jesus could have made before he ascended, but the promise that this present grief that they felt, this large kind of gaping hole of absence, that they felt that this was not the end, but that Jesus um, is not just going to send a friend or a leader in his place, but in fact, Jesus was going to send the very presence of God, not just to dwell in one place, but to dwell within each and every person. I think that that would have been something that would have been far greater than anything that they could have imagined on their own. And yet, this is not just a past reality, friends. It's not just a past reality uh, that we have found ourselves in a liminal space awaiting, waiting on God. Um, we too know that this power and presence and promise of the Holy Spirit is not just something of the past uh, but that we too are gifted with the grace and the promise of the Holy Spirit here and now. God dwells within us and around us and through the very presence of the Holy Spirit, we are equipped and empowered to be witnesses to the life and to the work of Jesus. Friends, I don't, I don't know where it feels like God is absent in your life or what liminal space you might find yourself in. I don't know where you need to be reminded of God's presence and promise um, of the Holy Spirit. But my hope today is that you will know that God's promises hold true. That the Holy Spirit's presence is with you and within you. And that just by the very presence of the Holy Spirit, you are equipped and empowered to do things far beyond your own imagination of what you might be able to do apart from the Spirit. I wonder today what skill you're working on or what hard thing you are trying to do or maybe what liminal space or season you find yourself in that maybe you can be reminded in that space that the Holy Spirit is present, standing there right next to you, ready and willing uh, to watch you do uh, what you do best. I'd like to leave uh, with a question, which is where in your life uh, do you need to be reminded of the presence of the Holy Spirit. And my hope for each and every one of us is that throughout this week, and we can know we are not alone, but we go in the presence and the power of the Holy Spirit, knowing that wherever it is that we go, whether in liminal space in, spaces, whether in grief, whether in, um, in turmoil and not knowing exactly what to do next, uh, we, can, we can jump knowing that the Holy Spirit is with us and empowers us to do things far greater than anything we can ever ask for or imagine. Amen. We invite you to stand and sing with us. Were creation suddenly articulate with a thousand tongues to lift one cry then from north to south and east to west we'd hear christ be magnified were the whole earth echoing his eminence his name would burst from sea and sky, from rivers to the mountaintops, we'd hear cries.
Stand strong and worship you And if it puts me in the fire I'll rejoice cause you're there too I won't be formed by feelings I'll hold fast to what is true If the cross brings transformation Then I'll be crucified with you Cause death is just a doorway Into resurrection life if I join you in your sufferings, then I'll join you when you rise. And when you return in glory with all the angels and the saints, my heart will still be singing, my song will be the same. Oh, Christ be magnified, let His grace arise. Again, it's been great to be with you together today. Uh, I would remind you, we'd love to know you're here. If you want to text us, just text the word hello to the number that's at the bottom of your screen. We'd love to follow up with you, uh, particularly if there are questions you have after today's worship or if there's something we can do to help you take the next step in your life of faith, your journey. Uh, we'd love to be able to do that with you, to partner with you in that way. Um, so don't hesitate to reach out. And again, if you'd like to join with us in mission and ministry here in Fuquay Verena, uh, you can go to our website, fvumc.org slash give. Uh, we'd love to your support. We'd love to partner with you in ministry in all sorts of different ways. We have plenty of other worshiping opportunities uh, live on Sunday morning, uh, as well as throughout the week. And so don't forget to hop over to our website, fvumc.org, to check out all those opportunities. We'd love to get a chance to meet you should the time come. Uh, and until then, uh, it's been great to worship together with you today.